Good afternoon, Blair. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, certainly. Uh, so my name is Blair Manton. I'm a licensed insolvency trustee and vice president of Sands & Associates. Uh, Sands & Associates is BC's largest firm of trustees focused on helping individuals and small businesses solve their financial problems. I've been a trustee since 2007 and I've been with Sands since 2010. Awesome. Okay, well I have my first question for you. It's uh, from Clarence and he writes, I have $45,000 in debt and can't afford to pay it off. Do I have to declare bankruptcy or what are my options? Right, so uh, that question is you know, pretty well bang on to the type of debts that we normally see. So the average person that we see owes between forty dollars and $50,000 typically, which again is right in the middle of this. Uh, you know, That's the biggest thing people say when they come in to see us is I've got all this debt, I don't know what my options are, and that's exactly what we do in a consultation. So let's talk about some options at a high level. You know, First off, you can try to pay the debt off in full, uh, knowing that uh, we were going to be doing some analysis on that amount of debt today. I've ran some numbers. So if you were to pay the debt off in full, 45000 over five years, you'd be looking at monthly payments of over $1,100, about $1,140. You know, another option a lot of people try to, to go towards, and it's definitely something to investigate, is a debt consolidation loan. Now, a lot of times people end up getting turned down by their bank because if you don't have a bunch of equity in your house, if you don't have, um, you know, a bunch of assets that potentially you can give a bank security over, it's going to be difficult to consolidate. But if you're able to do so, you know, we assume a consolidation rate will be about a five-year term, about a 12% interest rate. It'll cost you about $1,000 a month to deal with this $45,000 of debt. Now, you might be saying, well, that's too much. So if there's, there are options available to you if you're not able to pay the debt off in full. One option is to work with a not-for-profit credit counselor. Now, a not-for-profit credit counselor, typically they get compensated by your creditors, and their job is to get 100% of the debt back. So usually a not-for-profit credit counselor is going to be able to get an interest freeze on most of the debt. Now, not government debt for sure, but on most of the debt, which if you're going to pay off the full $45,000 of principal over five years, it's going to be about $750. The final option, and the one that we would typically try uh, to see if this is possible, if you're not able to afford paying off the debt in full and a consolidation loan is not going to be possible, let's look at a consumer proposal as an alternative. The way a consumer proposal works, and we're going to go into this a little bit more detail, we've got a few questions about it, is it's a compromise, and the big difference here is from a high of paying more than $1,100 per month to deal with this debt in five years, a consumer proposal could be a payment of around $225 per month. So in a consumer proposal, you pay off what you can afford to pay off, you get the same legal protection as a bankruptcy would give you, but you don't have to file for bankruptcy. So at $45,000 of debt, I would say speak to a trustee and let's see if a consumer proposal is going to make sense. Wonderful. I have a question here live from Olivia. She asks, so if there's $45,000 in debt, how much can I get that reduced to? Well, I think if we were just talking about the example here, if it was 45,000, you know, 225 um, over 60 months, that would be you paying back 30% of the debt. So typically the numbers that we see are a reduction of around 70%. Now, definitely everybody's situation is different. And, you know, some people have to pay back 100% of the debt. Some people are able to pay back, you know, less than 20% of the debt. It's all based on your ability to pay. It's based on your household budget. And it's based on, do you have other assets that, you know, perhaps would give you the ability to pay the debts off in full. I'm sorry if you got the house in West Van with no mortgage, you're typically not coming to me um, to deal with $45,000 of debt. You know, you're able to pay that debt. If you don't have significant assets, a proposal can typically reduce the debt very, very significantly. Great, okay, my next question here is from Sarah. She asks, how long will her, com her consumer proposal last if she gets one? Right, and that's, that's a good question because what I find with a lot of people, they're on the never-never plan, so to speak, and I love the credit card companies in the past couple of years. They've had to put this disclosure of how long is it going to take to pay off the debts if you're only going to make the minimum payments. Most of the time, people coming through our doors are seeing 50 or 60 years. Uh, a consumer proposal is nothing like that. So by law, a consumer proposal has to be finished within five years. So from the day you file the consumer proposal, your final payment has to occur within five years of that date. One of the best features of a consumer proposal is that if your situation improves, and you know many people, once they're able to deal with the stress of, of the debt, they're actually able to go out and they're able to earn more money, they're able to improve their household finances. If you're able to make extra payments on your consumer proposal, you can have it done essentially as quick as you can pay it off. So if we were able to settle the debts you know, for $300 a month over 60 months, that's $18,000. If that person chooses to pay $600 per month, well, they're going to have the proposal done in half of the time. So it's the maximum of five years, and it's as quick as you're able to pay off that reduced amount. Great. Okay, the next question is from Brad, and he asks, what's the difference between credit counseling versus a consumer proposal? 
Right, and that, that's a great question. Let's start with the similarity first, and this is something that just about everybody that I, I meet with is very surprised to learn, is that credit rating impact is actually the same whether you do a consumer proposal or you do a credit counseling plan. In both cases, you're making a compromise on your debts. In a credit counseling plan, you're generally getting a compromise on the interest. So you're paying back the full amount of the principal, 100% of the debt, but you're not paying any further interest. In, when you're filing a consumer proposal, the big difference is by law, generally the principal is reduced. So for the same credit rating impact on a consumer proposal, typically people are paying back, say, 30% of the debt, 50% of the debt, something like that. Whereas on a, on a credit counseling plan, because there's no legislative authority, this is all informal negotiations with your creditors, you have to pay back 100% of the debt. And again, the credit rating impact is the same. Where credit counseling makes sense for folks is if you can afford to pay off the full debt over time, you need a break on the interest, credit counseling can make a whole lot of sense. If you're not able to pay off the full amount of the debt over time, there are very few clients I've seen that would be better served by a debt management plan than a consumer proposal. Typically, a consumer proposal is going to give them the room in their budget that they need to actually live again. Okay, great. Uh, my next question comes from Steve. Steve asks, does bankruptcy or a consumer proposal impact my mortgage or car loans? No, is the answer. So. As long as you're up to date on secured debts, typically they're unimpacted by a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy. And let's spend a second here. So a secured debt means exactly what you said, a mortgage or a car loan. It's something if you don't pay, they're able to take those assets from you. So typically if someone files for bankruptcy or makes a consumer proposal, as long as they're up to date on their mortgage payments and their car payments, this is not an event of default. We've never had anybody who's been in a consumer proposal who hasn't been able to renew their mortgage as long as they're up to date on the payments. Similarly with a car loan, as long as you're up to date on the car loan, there's no issue with you retaining that vehicle. In fact, a lender would rather you retain that vehicle because that's how they make their money, you making the payments over time at an interest rate. If they have to seize a car from you, sell it at a shortfall, and then try to collect from you the difference, which by the way would be included in either a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal, it's actually worse off for the lender. So for the vast majority of, of people, they're actually in a better position to stay in their house and keep their car because if we can deal with the high debt payments by reducing them down in a consumer proposal, they're that much more able to make their regular mortgage and car payments each month. Okay, great. Uh, the next question comes from Jean, and Jean asks, how does it affect her credit rating when filing a consumer proposal? Really good question. I'd say there's nobody that comes through my door that doesn't ask about credit ratings, and I encourage people, you know, if they're watching or, or listening to this, to this live or otherwise, to really consider why is a credit rating important, and to understand that credit rating is something that can change over time, and it's not something that's going to be permanent. You know, you can have bad credit in the space of two or three years, you can, you can rebuild your credit very quickly. So the way your credit rating is impacted when you don't pay your debts back in full is every debt you have is rated from R1, which is you're a perfect consumer, you never miss a payment, to R9, you file for bankruptcy and the debts have been written off. If it's a consumer proposal, it reflects as an R7 on your credit, which is the same as we mentioned as a credit counseling plan. It shows that you're in a negotiated repayment arrangement with your creditors. A consumer proposal is going to be cleared from your credit report within two to three years after your final payment. So this is why, as we mentioned earlier, if you're able to pay the proposal off sooner, the benefit to you is you're going to rebuild your credit that much more quickly. So typically two to three years after your last payment is when it's going to drop off your credit. What's really important and a really big part of the consumer proposal is you have to come and meet with us for financial counseling. We tell you exactly what to do to rebuild your credit. There's no rocket science here. It all comes down to you being a responsible consumer, starting with a secured credit card and just never missing payments as you go forward. Typically, we see people, even from a bankruptcy, which is very severe on your credit, even from a bankruptcy, rebuilding their credit within two to three years after the bankruptcy. Though it's going to be noted for six years after your discharge, if you've done everything right for two to three years after a bankruptcy and you've been able to save a down payment, typically you're not going to have challenges when you're looking to get a mortgage or get other credit. You've just got to be able to use it responsibly. Great. Okay, our next question here is from Naomi. And Naomi asks, how much does a consumer proposal cost? Right. Good question. Is there a bunch of upfront fees? What I'm going to have to pay to get this, this off the ground? Um, so everything that you do with a licensed insolvency trustee is set by law. So there's a government tariff that says if you're dealing with a trustee, we're administering the law, and it says exactly what a trustee gets paid. For our clients, typically they don't have huge amounts of money that they're sitting on when they come in to see us, so of course the initial consultation is free. 
Any meetings after that are free as well. Essentially, we don't take any payments until we figured out if the proposal is going to work for this person and we sent it out to the creditors. So the way that we work is if a proposal is for $300 a month, we ask that you make the proposal payment when we sign the documents, and then if the proposal is approved, you just continue making that payment. There's nothing separate that you're ever charged, so if the debts are reduced, you know, down again to $300 a month, you don't pay anything on top of that for the trustee's assistance. Everything is built in. It's all subject to government tariff. Wonderful. Uh, my next question comes from John, and he asks, I have RSPs and some savings for my child's education. What will happen to these if I, if I file a consumer proposal? Well, in both of those cases, it's a pretty straightforward answer, and this is one of the best benefits of doing a consumer proposal is, by definition, you keep all of your assets when you do a proposal. So in those scenarios, um, if it was John, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so if John were to file for bankruptcy, his RRSP would likely be safe. It's only if he's put a bunch of money in the last year, so the RRSP would be okay. Um, but his RESP, the money he saved for his kids, and I fundamentally disagree that this is the right law, but the way it is in BC, there's no exemption for RESP. So it means if he filed for bankruptcy, that RESP would have to get sold to, to pay off his debts. By filing a consumer proposal, the whole point of it is he's offering his creditors a better recovery than if he filed for bankruptcy and all of his assets were liquidated. What that means um, is that he's able to keep all of his assets. He's able to keep his RRSPs, he's able to keep his RESPs. No notation is you know, given to the bank, there's no codes or any seizes placed in them. His proposal supersedes any reason for him to give up any of his assets. Okay, great. Um, John has another question here asking, will the consumer proposal affect his spouse? In general, the answer is no. And most people are very surprised to learn that when you marry somebody, you don't marry their debt. You know, just because your wife or husband has significant student loans or significant credit card debt, because you're married or because you're cohabitating or anything like that, it doesn't create any shared liability. The only situations where there would be any impact at all on a spouse is if there's a debt that's co-signed or that is joint. So be careful if there's supplementary cards. You know, clearly if the statement is coming and it's got both spouses' names on it, that's probably a debt that's going to be collected from both. So what's likely to happen is that the individual who files the proposal, definitely the creditor can never come to them for payment. They have to accept, you know, the 30 to 50 cents on the dollar. However, if the other spouse is joint or co-signed on those debts, the creditor is going to try to collect from them. What we typically do in those situations is we look at doing a joint filing or perhaps having both spouses file proposals at the same time so the creditors have no ability to come up to the other person. But in the vast majority of cases, if spouses have kept their finances relatively separate, and that just means, you know, separate credit cards or separate debts, there's no impact whatsoever of one spouse filing a proposal on the other. Your credit ratings are completely separate and you filing a proposal is not going to impact the credit of your spouse. Okay, our next question comes from Morgan, and Morgan asks, what happens if my circumstances change and I can't make payments? Right, and, and that's, that's huge, right? Because if you get into a consumer proposal and you know, you're not able to continue with the payments, it can be a big challenge. So the way the legislation is written is you're allowed to miss payments periodically on the consumer proposal, but not very many. You know, this is meant to really get you back on track, and that's why before we file a consumer proposal, we really look at the person's household budget, their family situation, just trying to make sure this is a payment that can be made each month. That being said, things do happen. So once the proposal has went to three months in arrears, essentially it goes into default. So that means after three months of no payments, it's in this status of default. If it's not caught up within 30 days, the proposal fails at that point. And, you know, it's a very tough situation. The person might have to consider a bankruptcy at that point. The biggest thing to keep in mind is just to keep in contact with your trustee. Um, if your trustee knows that there's been a circumstance, a change in circumstance, as long as you're up to date on the proposal, we can file an amended proposal to your creditors. We can say there's been an income interruption, there's been a health issue, something has happened with the family, and for a period of time, there can be some reduced payments or even a reduction in the overall amount, as long as the creditors will accept it. So there's the option to amend the proposal, but if we wait too long, if we let it go into default, then essentially we're handcuffed by the regulations, which are after three months of default, uh, three months of missed payments, it's in default, and within 30 days after that, the proposal can become annulled, which means the person's debts come back. So again, want to make sure it's a good budget before you get set up, and there are options to amend the proposal if it doesn't work. Okay, great. Uh, we got one last question here from Sue. Just Sue, one. Wow, this has been quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sue asks, where can I get more information um, on actually filing the proposal, a consumer proposal? Well, you can call us, Sands and Associates, clearly, but um, 
very seriously, this is not something you ever need to pay anybody a dollar to figure out about. So there's a lot of folks that are out there, they say that they'll represent you, they'll give you good advice, and some of them look very, you know, very nice and reputable. At the end of the day, unless you're dealing with a licensed insolvency trustee, you're not getting all the facts. You may be getting somebody that's self-interested in the situation. When you're dealing with a trustee, we're bound by a code of ethics. There's less than a thousand trustees in Canada, and we're all very protective of our licenses. So when you deal with a trustee by law, I have to take you through all of your options. It's a free complimentary consultation, and until we get to the point where we've actually solved the problem, you're not going to pay a dollar. And at the end point, when you do have to pay something, it's going to be something that fits within your budget. So the best thing to do is to figure out which licensed insolvency trustee is active in your community, go in for a meeting, see do you, do you get along well with the person, and a really key thing there is just what I said, go in for the meeting. You have to meet face to face with your trustee. You have to understand this is a real person, this is someone that's committed to the community and committed to turning your life around with you. If you're doing work over the phone, if you're dealing with people that are based in the U.S. or based out of province, you are probably spending money that you're not going to get back and you're probably not solving the problem. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Blair. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.